You can tell when we're a little bit, oh, Mike's. It's upside down. Maybe the cup is upside down. Hi, everybody. You can tell when we're, when we're a little behind time uh, getting John Schaefer, our guest today, all sorted out and get Julie and myself sorted out here in the studio. Welcome to show number four. 81, Julie, I trust you are well. Yes, indeed. Any hot tips? Oh, mostly cool and rainy tips. Yeah, well, it's not going to be that rainy. All this. Uh, Mar- Once again, Mark Michelson was right. We had a bit of rain here the other day. We had a couple inches in the bottom of the garage, but yeah. nothing, you know, nothing like we had the other day when we had. Or we're what, going to have on Sunday. Yeah, but even that's going to be an. I, it's going to be an inch and a half or so. No huge deal. Welcome to Studio B. Here, each street yacht club in Overcast and chilly San Francisco. But um, wherever in the world you are, we hope your weather is nice, and um, you're not going to get rained on like we are this weekend. Although, not that bad. Let's get into the pre-start, um, our pre-start vi- uh, slide. It's not a video. Thorson, the yacht is called the race committee boat at the Royal Yacht Club of Victoria. I like that. It's always nice to have them um, featured mm-hmm. down in Australia. Uh, talking about this, you thanks for all your comments and you're asking about this atmospheric river that we've been having. An atmospheric river according to NOAA, are long, narrow bands of highly concentrated uh, water. They form near the equator where warm water temperatures cause the water to evaporate and rise into the atmosphere. And as atmospheric circulation pulls some of the water vapor away from the equator, it becomes concentrated into a narrow band. The water vapor flows in the lower atmosphere until it reaches a coast or mountain range and is forced to rise, leading to the formation of clouds and precipitation. Atmospheric rivers occur all over the world and vary in size and intensity, with some spanning hundreds to even thousands of miles. They're the largest rivers, I did not know this, of fresh water on Earth, transporting as much as 15 times the flow at the mouth of the Mississippi. Atmospheric river-driven storms can last for several days and bring significant amounts of precipitation. The Pacific Northwest, and here in Northern California, is one of the regions particularly impacted by atmospheric rivers, sometimes called the Pineapple Express if it comes from Hawaii. Although atmospheric rivers can bring much needed precipitation to dry areas, they can also cause heavy rainfall and flooding. No shit, Sherlock, excuse my language. (laughs) To better measure atmospheric rivers and convey, I didn't know this, I've never heard of this, cat one through five, five point category scale. And yes, that's uh, what you've been hearing about. Thanks for all of your comments from around the world about our little problems here in California the last few days. We don't need to see her, thanks to Noah. But this now, Julie, you know where that is? Uh, No. That is down near your hometown of Carpinteria, down south of us here on California's coast. That is from below Santa Barbara Yacht Club, as now the wind and surf are causing problems. Tide has just turned. Here we go. Last night. Side. All right. Just had a huge one a second ago. Not sure it's going on over here. Yeah, no, there is finally recognizable. Yeah. This is Sharon Green, the esteemed photographer and Fozzy. That was a berm. It's Shooting now this. long gone. And talking from last night. As the sun was going down, you can see in the west, hoping that it didn't wash the club away overnight. And I'm pleased to say it did not. So they're in good shape at Santa Barbara Yacht Club today. But it's going to be windy. It's going to be wet. And it's going to be wetter down there, south of us, Julia, than. Uh, what we had last weekend when we had that almost, what was it, 10, 10 and a half inches, 11 and a half inches yeah. of rain? Mm-hmm. Some kind of a new record or near record. But it's uh, calming down here. We're going to get some rain over the next few days. But thanks again for all of your concern. It's interesting how the news reports take a day or two or three to kind of per- percolate right. out through the rest of the world. It, it's still uh, unnerving to see the streets of San Francisco become, become rivers. Well, I- exactly. And... Hopefully that's not going to happen this weekend. 
like it did last weekend. That's correct. Thanks, Sharon Green, for that video. Sharon, the famous photographer, originally from Canada. Her dad, the late great Don Green, Mean Green. Not Mean Green. What was the name of their boat? Up in Toronto, Toronto, Canada. And she's now a senior member of Santa Barbara Yacht Club, Sharon Green. Good for her. World-class photographer. Yeah. Uh, you know what day it is today, Julia? Here's your first and the, only clue. Uh, yeah, it's the it, it's the sixth. I mean, it's the last day of. Spit it out. Here, you want the lower third? Look on your monitor. <laughs> of Christmas. Twelfth day of Christmas, right. the sixth of January. Hamish Ross says sometimes it's the fifth, sometimes it's the sixth, depending upon whether you celebrate the twelve days starting on Christmas Day, or you're starting on the on Boxing Day on the day after Christmas. But right. Most people say it's the 6th of January. We used to run a big party down in San Diego on the 6th of January. I've started, Julia, taking some of the decorations down here at the Beach Street Yacht Club this morning (laughs) early on. Evergreen. Thanks, Steve Gruber. Steve, he is so knowledgeable. He's so good. Thank you for that, sir. And um, it is the 12th day of Christmas and the day on which we end our Christmas season. You can see behind Julia, I've replaced the plant with a trophy, mm-hmm. a be- beautiful pewter, uh, ice, uh, what do you call those? It's an ice a bucket uh-huh. behind you and a plant that's been in here, in this studio on and off for years. And it's amazing I haven't killed it off. And I've removed our poinsettia, or some of you call them poinsettias, but poinsettia. On this, the 12th day of Christmas, also called the Aldea, the day, Aldea de los Reyes in Espanol, on the 12th day of Christmas, January 6th, we celebrate three Kings Day in many countries, mm-hmm. especially Catholic countries, celebrated most in Europe, Spain, and Latin America. Aldea de los Reyes, as it's called in Spanish, marks the glorification of baby Jesus by the three wise men. Julia, for extra credit, what were the three wise men reputed to have be carrying as gifts? Gold, myrrh, and frankincense. Well done. In that order? No. <laughs> we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts. We travel. We travel, travel are far. Are far, yeah. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> Christmas is gone. <laughs> Captain yeah. Jack is laughing at us. He's watching patiently <laughs> in Annapolis. He's not singing with us. <laughs> well, maybe he will when we get him on here in a sec. Um, <laughs> Speaking of which, that gets us to the starting line. Uh, Again, I'm using this photo, the uh, Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, the start of the Rolex Sydney Hobart race from uh, Boxing Day, the day after Christmas last week. And uh, what a terrific event that has, as usual, turned out to be. Julia, did you see, in fact, I'll save this until I get Jack on because I'm going to get him to comment on this as well. Let's press on here to the coach's corner with our good friend and Fozzie Super Fozzie, John Emmett. And he's got another lively report, and here it is. Roll tape. Hi, Tom, Julia, and all the Fozzie, and looking forward to a really, really good show today. Don't know if you've got a little bit of background music. Looks like the IQ foil sailors have uh, come up and uh, are going out to play. It's uh, Friday. Uh, before a very, very windy weekend here at the Weymouth and Portland National Sailing Academy. And I know it's going to be a good day because pretty much everyone's here. We've got the Moth Worlds in 2023 and uh, the Ilkas are actually outnumbered by the Moths. So a little bit of a chat about our smarter goals before we go out and do it. In fact, this weekend, if it's a windy weekend, probably there'll be an awful lot more chat. The aim of Smarter Goals is to make sure we really know where we are, where we're trying to get to. And one of the most important things there is to measure it. So some things, really easy to measure. We can measure our body weight, post Christmas, no problem. Um, Other things like boat speed, there's been a huge advance now that we can actually record these very clearly with things like GPS and tracking, and that's moved on a lot. Some things like your mental state, your mental preparation, your anxiety, they're much harder to measure. But going back to earlier in the last show, we talked about being specific. So you need to be specific and measured. And in terms of your mental motivation, I'd say measurement is really important because you can not only see where you are, 
but you can see where you've come from and then hopefully you can see where you're going to get. So I say some things like body weight, it's incredibly easy to measure, some things which aren't, but keeping that record and that permanent record is a big thing. Now we virtually always have uh, mobile phones, tablets, laptops with us at all times, so it's so easy to record things. And in terms of my own coaching, I do a lot of video and can record that so I have a catalogue of good techniques. So yeah, number two, M for measure. Have a great show and I will see you later. John Emmett, not sponsored. <laughs> By Gillette as I put that little graphic in Oh, there. I was going to say, huh? that's new. Well, we should. We should call Gillette up and every time that John looks like he's got a, well, he hasn't shaved in, in a couple of weeks, it looks like. Yeah, it, there are various opinions of what it looks like. Well, I think it looks great. And I wish, uh, see, now he's clean shaven. Yes, with so his and mother. And this is tonight. This is his evening over there on Friday evening. He is in what he says is an all-you-can-eat Asian buffet. He didn't spell Asian correctly, but we won't hold that against him. He was dashing that out with his thumbs on his phone, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And Sophia, Sophia, who's the third from the left, or third from the right, is, as you wish, is uh, being coached by John over the holidays. I think she's 16. Mm-hmm. She's young, and she went to the Youth Worlds for China uh, recently, and those are her parents whose names escape me, but uh, John and his mom there, of course, are at an Asian buffet celebrating tonight, Friday night, the 12th day of Christmas, I suppose. Nice. (laughs) Maybe not. Isn't that nice? Yes. John Emmett sailing, get to the front of the fleet, and Julia, he makes me wonder whether want to get Apple. You have an Apple Watch, yep. now, although it's not the latest and greatest one. It's a, what, what number is that? 14. No, no, I no, mean, no. four. It's a four. Yeah. And the latest one is an eight. Yeah. And I was looking between the eight and the ultra, which is the really ruggedized, hard Apple Watch that's just right. come out here in the last few months. And it does everything but sing you lullabies at night. Maybe it would even do that. Probably. But I'm thinking about getting an Apple Watch now for, as John was discussing, for health reasons. Mm-hmm. So you can take your BP, you can take an electrocardiogram. The right. 8 does that. Yeah. The 4 doesn't. Your 4 doesn't. But the 8 does. It also, you can push your finger on it and get your blood oxygen. And yeah. put it on the crown, I guess. What you can't do is get um, uh, the, your blood pressure. I don't know if you can get BP. You may have to still do that with a cuff. Maybe we'll ask John um, about that and what he uses, and we'll ask Andrew McIrvin, yeah. who's coming on the show on Tuesday. Oh, good. Mr. Yes. Dr. Andrew. It's time for a new one. Mine, mine is Raggedy Andy. Well, your watch band is. You could replace that. Oh, yes, but but it's not holding it. And you don't have it on now because you're afraid you'll get a call during the show, and you very kindly leave it <laughs> up at the Commodore Suite. <laughs> because if I don't, I get skinned. <laughs> well, I, I literally have, I take it off her wrist. She comes in here and I say, Julia, have you turned that off? I don't know how to turn it off. I'm not sure. It's, so I take it off, <laughs> take it into another room, put it under a pillow and close the door so that the damn watch doesn't go off. Your phone is off, right? Yep. Good, good job. Okay, let's get to our guest today. We're delighted to have back. He's been, I think, the third show we've had him on here in the last couple of weeks. Um, an offshore expert, uh, just an all-around good guy, and has become quite a good friend over the years, although I'm not even sure we've ever met in person. Uh, joining us from Annapolis, Maryland, is Captain Jack, John Schaefer, better known to many of you as Captain Jack. Welcome, sir. Good morning. How are you guys? Well, I hope it's afternoon there, because it sure as hell is here on the West Coast. Well, well, I took my watch off. <laughs> so it's not going to go off. <laughs> and this is the watch you should be buying. Or, what what watch is it, John? So if you're on a boat, it's got to be the Aquatic 6 or, uh, or or the captain from Garmin. Aquatic 6? Aquatic, no A, just Aquatic 6. Aquatic 6. Yeah, it's got a start program on it, if you can believe it. Tell you how far you are from the line. It's fantastic. From it's, Garmin. Uh, yeah, you can run your... Uh, your music off of it, and you, while you're on your boat, you can run your autopilot off of it. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe hey. we can get them to sponsor the show. Are they a sponsor of the Ministry of Sailing? I wish. Carmen, <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> you know, there's only uh, two types of watches you should wear if you're a sailor. Uh, the first one, of course, is the Garmin when you're on your water. But then there's the after-dinner party, which should be the Rolex. But you've, you must win the Rolex in order for it not to be, as my grandfather would always say, 
the only thing cheesier than a real <laughs> uh, than a fake Rolex is the real Rolex. <laughs> <laughs> that one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A Submariner. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you got to win it though. A cocktail watch. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah. sort of won. I did not win it in a, I know I didn't get presented at the watch, but I did get it presented by Rolex when I was chairman of the Rolex Yachtsman of the Year that uh, here in the U.S. And they said, hey, you know, we appreciate what you're doing. And I did it for a number of years when I was executive director of U.S. Sailing. And they said, come to New York, we'll give you a good deal. And boy, they made it. It was a big production, Julia. Yeah. I mean, they took you back and they took you into the vault and they produced. They said, this is the watch. Ah, maybe not this one. This is the watch you should have. I, I, you know, I'm like, well, how much is this going to cost? Mm -hmm. And I went back and told my wife after I paid, you know, what to me was a, a princely sum at the time. It was, mm -hmm. still is even today. But it's worth probably, what, four or five times now what it was worth in 1984. Mm -hmm. But Rolex has been great. And I, I, I must say, John, Julia, they have to be considered one of the very best sponsors in the history of the sport, if not the best. What do you think? Absolutely. It's interesting because if you look at the behind the scenes of the awards presentations, uh, whenever they sponsor, you, you see everybody taking off their Garmin watches before they go on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, let's uh, let's get back into the show because now that we've got John, I brought him on a little early before we do his segment because I want to do the Rolex Sydney to Hobart segment. Mm -hmm. Now this is the winner, Celestial, and after they got tossed in the water, Sam Haynes there on the right, the owner and skipper. And you may have seen uh, of late, and uh, since we talked about this here on the show, there is now an issue of whether their win was correct or croutonic, and there are some assertions, and, uh, and this was crazy. In fact, several of you, Mary Jude Szymanski, among others, sent me a note saying, hey, what the hell is this all about? John Sangmeister wrote to me and said, would you please send me that picture, which we ran on the show, Yeah, you know, it, it wasn't anything uh, exclusive to us, but I picked this picture out of, I guess it was Carlo Berlanghi's shots that he took for the Rolex Sydney to Hobart, and that, of course, is Celestial with their quad head rig. Mm -hmm. And then Sailing Anarchy ran a piece the other day, as you probably saw, Captain Jack, saying this was illegal. And that, that Celestial had withdrawn from the race, which, of course, they had not withdrawn. What they did, since like a lot of races today, they're scored under multiple rating rules. Mm -hmm. And I hope, Mary Jude, I explained this to you. I was texting with Mary Jude a couple of days ago. But anybody else who's confused by that Sailing Anarchy article or any of the other press that has appeared in the meantime, under IRC, and, and we're going to have Andrew McIrvin explain some of the differences next week, and maybe, John, you want to comment. Under IRC, this rig, this is permitted. The free-flying jib, the, 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 this sail, second from the left, if you will, the kite, the first one under the kite, under ORC, which is another rating system, many of you will be from, with which many of you will be familiar, that flying jib is not permitted. It has to be tacked down on the deck like the other two. If I think I have that right. And under ORC, that is not permitted. But the main Tattersall trophy, the main event for the Sydney to Hobart, is scored under IRC and that rig, that system. Right, Jack? John? Yeah, that's exactly right. Is, and Sydney and Hobart is basically it's an IRC race, right? And so, so that's why um, it's important. No, but they, you know, Celestial did a good thing on there, though. You know, this is a self-policing sport. There was no protest when they realized what they did was against the ORC. They immediately withdrew. So from they their, the they withdrew from their ORC, correct? Divisional win because they also won ORC. But when they realized that was not permitted under ORC or ORCI, which is a subdivision, they, they withdrew. So that was the right thing to do. Now, with all due respect to Dobbs Davis, our good friend, um, who's pushing ORC, at least in this country, do you have, do you have a comment? Do you have a preference between our IRC and ORC? <laughs> How's that for a political question? Yeah, uh, well, for <laughs> me, I prefer ORC over PHRF. <laughs> because my boat, my boat's a Catalina 445, and mm -hmm. I'm still arguing with everybody about my rating. <laughs> yes. So, of course, I'll take anything other than PHRF. And for those who are not familiar, 
besides IRC and ORC, the, one of the others, Channel Handicap in Europe, which is, well, we won't go into that, but uh, PHRF, which is a political system. There are committees, Julie, as you know, around the country, PHRF handicapping committees, who look at a boat and they look at how it's rigged and they look at how well it's sailed. And then they come up with a, shall we say, not arbitrary, but what the, it, it is not based an informed. on. informed. <laughs> it's, it's an informed rating. And many of these committees do a darn good job. Mm-hmm. And where the boats are not traveling around and they're boats that are come from large fleets so they can use the numbers, the, the, the results for, horm- for performance handicap rated fleet. And it's based on the performance of the yacht. Yeah. Problem with PHRF, John, is that sometimes the, the 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 strength, the ability of the crew gets rated rather than the speed of the boat. Well, in, in my case, with two air conditioners and a gen set, what they did with my score is they compared it to the Genos and the Benetos, and they said, well, we can't give you what you really need because you just kill everybody else that you're racing against. So they don't <laughs> do a measurement based upon your boat. They do the measurement based upon everybody else in your fleet. <laughs> and who's a friend and you of theirs? Politics. And, and to be fair, it's inexpensive. Costs very little to get a PHRF rating. And for the, probably the bulk of recreational sailing, at least in this country, it works very well and it's quite popular. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Lots of years. Yeah, it's popular, but there, you know, there's another one that's creeping up, OREZ, which is really nice. So the OREZ is a better rating. What's nice about the OREZ rating is you're getting a rating based on a heavy downwind or a heavy upwind, or you're getting a race on a medium upwind or downwind, and then they do percentages, whatever the offshore race is going to be. So it's a more of a leveling plane based upon the wind. You know, with my boat, I cannot compete unless the wind's going 25 knots. And then everybody drops out, so I'm out there by myself. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, well, enough. I, I sprung that one on you. I didn't tell you in the tech check we were going to cover that, but, you know, why not? This is Sailing Illustrated. Yep. We can talk about anything we want, right? That, well, that's exactly right. And and even though people think that I'm moving ballast from one of my water tanks to the other tank, I just want to let you know that's not true. <laughs> Too heavy. <laughs> Too heavy. <laughs> so there's the, as uh, John has explained, and we explained as well, I guess the Celestials quad head. You call that a quad head rig, John? Is that what you call it? Well, yeah, they're, they're running four up there. So I, I would say it's a quad. They're running quads. Instead of we trips, normally yeah. call it a tri, but as all those boats came out of the, the, Sydney heads and we're in the Northeast or going downhill. A lot of them, especially the bigger boats put up three jibs inside of their kite. And it was a magnificent sight. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just changing topics uh, within Sydney Hobart before we leave Katie Pettibone and day. I've actually now talked or texted at least with David, with Ratty, David Blanchfield, who is recovering nicely, not a hundred percent. He's out and about. You saw, you saw a Facebook post with Ratty. Oh uh, yeah, I saw it. Uh, I think yesterday he was out in the docks. Yeah, so he's he's mobile. He's out and about. I'm going to talk to him later this afternoon by phone, and probably record something that we'll use on Tuesday's show. But um, if if not, we'll get him back here and get him on the show one way or another. With Katie, by the way, who is his partner here, living in California now, and a terrific sailor in her own right. Two of the best sailors probably here in California. These two. Tuesday, we hope to have a Ratty interview. Uh, an interview with Ratty, not in a Ratty interview. <laughs> <laughs> Julia. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Okay, John, first slide from you. Thanks again for coming on. Tell us, what is the Ministry of Sailing leaders, loggies, I know that means logistics now, I now know that, leaders, loggies, sailors, and more. What is the Ministry of Sailing? Well, pretty much uh, it's a group of individuals that got together, uh, some from the United Kingdom, from from Australia and the United States. We really started this after uh, the 2020 Heineken Regatta. Uh, we were on a Volvo 65, and it was right then in the first or second week of March that the world shut down, and we saw that we were not going to be sailing in that year. So we decided uh, to take one of the uh, issues that we've been talking about for years about how to place a person in the water to rescue another person from a sailboat. And we've been talking about this for about 15, 16 years. It's been used on a lot of professional boats, but we thought it was time to do a certification because as you know, we're going to safety at sea courses and people are doing that, we're seeing a lot of differences that's going on and how people approach 
when a person's incapacitated in the water, or um, you know when you just can't get close enough to retrieve a person. And so what we've done, and for two reasons, number one, where we think it's important to add another profession in sailing, to have a certified rescue swimmer. Um, it really enhances the sport, just like some races require um, medical uh, certifications or doctors to be on board some of the offshore boats or, or medical training. We think it's important that uh, we can provide this for some boats, not necessarily every boat, every boat might not need them or every boat might not have the proper equipment in order to use a sailing rescue swimmer but the other reason is as soon as we have a certification and a standard uh it it, it really starts showing uh and stopping other people to trying things on their own and starting to protect um uh, uh the people that are rescue swimmers and there should be some certain qualifications uh, which we explain in our rescue sailing handbook uh which we put out and that's one of our training tools how, how, do, how does one get a hold of that book? So it'll be on our website. I mean, if anybody were just to search Sailing Rescue Swimmer, it comes up number one on Google, and it's available under the Rescue Swimmer tab. And it's also the same thing if you just search Ministry of Sailing. It comes up number one on Google. You'll see our website. So that's where you get that. And, and just one thing I want to stop here. This shirt I'm wearing here is from Mark Michelson. Aha. So dry, dry UV, an, another FOSI. Yeah, indeed, and our weather expert or weather guru who helped sort us out the other day, and again, he was right when he told us that, you know, this next rainstorm, he told us that on Tuesday, and indeed Wednesday and Thursday, despite sandbags coming out, I moved my car out of the garage in case it came up through the garage drain, and some friends of ours over here on Marina Boulevard's car, her, you know, uh, our friend's car is still parked out here in front, Yeah, it's because they, she doesn't want to leave it in her garage. Meanwhile, another car, a Corvette, an old historic and historic Corvette, which was in her garage when three feet of water came oh, up. Remember that photo I showed yeah. in the show Tuesday? Yeah. So Michelson, good guy. He also, he and his wife, in fact, it's his wife's company that he helps out. He's always quick to say, is one yep. of the best t-shirt purveyors and sailing clothes. Yes. Uh, cotton or quick drying, other, you know, polyester type stuff around. But Ministry of Sailing is not part of any government agency, least of all in a government agency in this country or a state agency. It's a cool name that you and your partner, who are your partners? Well, one of the authors is uh, Marcus Charlton Brown. Uh, Marcus uh, won the, I think it was 2013 around the world, the Clipper. He, he's on some really great boats, usually 65s, Volvo 70s uh, in the Caribbean. Um, he, he's in Newport a lot. Everybody in the industry pretty much knows Marcus. And then uh, 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 Mike McCarty, also Mike McCarty, a big 12 meter guy. I think he was, I think both of them at one time were captains on uh, America too. And uh, usually when we're on the 12 meters up at Newport, uh, we're together mixed up on some boats, usually in some form or fashion, uh, which is often uh, the case. And so we really talk a lot about that because it's usually the older guys that can fly the kites on the 12s and I'm, I'm in that category now. How about Brits, Aussies, Kiwis, anybody yeah. else? Absolutely. So we got we got a great staff. Uh, other people that helped us uh, put the book together is um, uh, uh, Bicey uh, out of Australia. So Nick Bice. Uh, we have also um, uh, Jack out of uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, so Jack, another another Jack, right? Uh, former Royal Marine Rescue. All right. And the advisors that helped put this together are also uh, we have NASA Rescue. Uh, we have Air Force PJ Rescue, and we have rescue swimmers from the Navy and also the Coast Guard that really help put this book together and put the guidelines together, the procedures together, decision-making together. But most importantly, uh, as we talk about some of the slides here, those areas that most recently become dangerous that have caused issues in the past, and that's what this slide is, this dangers of dragging and other safety tips, which is one of the modules. The other thing is what we've done with the Ministry of Sailing for this certification is we understand um, and for cost effectiveness, because the last thing owners want to do is keep spending more money or even individuals, because we do have an expensive sport, is we've placed all of the certification videos and all of the training online at no cost. And you can just go through all the videos and, and, and then we have a test and all of that preps you on the groundwork. And once you pass that, you'll have the ability then 
you know, to go and search and find one of our trainings, which is going to be happening all throughout the world, and then take the final deck test certification to become a certified rescue swimmer. Okay, well, take us through these slides of uh, this rescue swimmers will demonstrate knowledge and understanding of. Carry on. Yeah, all right. So on this one, it's the gas re reflex, you know, actions for the person in the water. A lot of times when people give, um, uh, when people give a, uh, uh, a briefing beforehand, you know, they talk about what the procedures are for the MOB, but they don't necessarily talk about the actions for the person in the water, if you're that person in the water to prepare them. And so we kind of include that in the briefing as well. And then we talk about what we talked about the other day, you showed the video for the instinctive drowning response. This is a new uh, research that came out. This is specifically mentioned in the after action report for Emedi and what happened to the individual when John went overboard and they couldn't get a hold of John. So it's all specifically uh, in there. And then we talk about, um, you know, psychological um, uh, impact uh, in the midst of an emergency. And this comes from a lot of the military training because some of the logistics or the loggies and some of the military people, part of the, uh, of the Ministry of Sailing, you know, we've been trained on how to, you know, reset your brain in the midst of an emergency, all right, so you can actually perform well. Because over time, stress, it, it diminishes your motor skills because your body is bracing for impact. Your body is bracing for something bad to happen. And so what happens is uh, the blood in your body pools into your major organs. And so your eyesight might narrow, your thinking might become confused. You can't do multitasking or thinking and you lose motor movement in your hands. Uh, and so we teach people what those signs are in this module and then how the leaders can break people out of that so they can take a deep breath, give them directions to reset their psyche to get them back on the page. And then last thing, the dragging and drowning in, in this module. Uh, if a person falls overboard in the vessel and they're still being dragged, uh, it only takes four knots of speed being dragged off of the side of a boat in order for them specifically if their tether is in the midline of their body hooked up on the D-rings uh, like we mostly are, uh, it only takes four knots of boat speed uh, for that person to be dragged under the water so they can't breathe. And so we really talk about in this module a technique which we've developed to really help people practice and understand first and foremost how to get person a person or a sailor um, that's being dragged by the boat off of that situation. Okay, let's go um, through so, the slides then. Sure. And quickly give us uh, the, the gas reflex. You've explained some of this. So the gas reflex is usually happens in cold water where instinctively your body just, when you hit the water, goes. <gasps> and so we train that, all right, and our, we, we expect that the rescue swimmers are the leading safety people on the boat. We need them to be leaders, and that's why there's a training that we go through there. So it's to understand that when people go in the water when it's cold, that there's a certain way you want to enter the water to prevent that gasp reflex or that inhalation. It's involuntary when you hit the water, you, you, you just go <gasps> like this. And so we train people how to do that by basically trying to land with your back on the water and cover your face. Uh, this is done in most military units when you're doing water and drown proofing training. And we want to include that also in training uh, for all the people on the deck when you're in cold water. So that's what that one is, that gas reflex. And so we're putting the mitigation in there to train that. Again, this should be included in your MOB briefings, not just how to turn the boat around. So this is the gas torso reflex. How you... That's exactly right. The gas reflex or the medical term would be the torso reflex. Uh, so when you search that on the internet, you'll see what those are. So you just want to cover your face and your mouth with your hands before you hit the water. And you try to, you want to reduce uh, or try to manipulate your body while you're in the air, if you can, or while you're falling, when you have that moment, when you know you're going to the water, you want to try to twist so your back hits the water first. Okay. And of course, you hope you're, you are uh, not been knocked out in the meantime, right? Well, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. So next we're talking about, um, so this one just goes through is, this is the briefing, what we talk about, uh, how to brief the individuals uh, on the boat of what the expectations are if you are the person that's in the water. This, so this we, of course, you know, is ahead of time. I, you don't do this once exactly you're in the water, right. obviously. Yeah, exactly. And this is ahead of time. This would be your briefing ahead of time. And this is what you would want to practice. And when we talk about a briefing, this is a continual type of briefing on the boat. And one of the things we actually talk about is that continuous safety briefing. So the leaders of the boat 
have a continual briefing that's going on. Like for instance, if we have a rescue swimmer on board, we have an identified rescue halyard, which one we're gonna be using to rig. And so if that changes from tack to tack or jibe to jibe, this is a continual communication process. So we talk about the continual safety briefing, which goes on in the conversation in the boat to keep everybody online. And so this is, you know, these are just the tips uh, uh, for the person that's in the water. And I think one of the things you want to take home on this is, you know, we add a flashlight. So if you think about the uh, a Meridian accident, again, in Chicago Mac, a few years even before I met the Meridian accident, uh, one of the things that came out of that study is a pen light was used, all right, to stick your arm out of the water. And that pen light was used to direct at the boat so they could see where the swimmer in the water was or the, where the person in the water was. And so for us uh, on our crew and our boats, since we have VH radios that are waterproof that are so inexpensive now, you can buy two VH waterproof radios, very small, uh, for a hundred dollars. If we have vests on, we have radios attached to our PFDs. The principle for that is if you have a person in the water, you want to talk to them. We have pen lights and then all of the other standards which go for the offshore racing problem. But I think it's really important that your briefings include and your dialogues and your training always include these key aspects for the person that just might be in the water as well. And if you're racing, you know, you want to do a quick 360 to turn around because most likely in a race, specifically if it's a PHRF or around the can or beer can racing, you have the closest boat's going to be behind you because it's your, your competitor. Yeah, indeed. Uh are all these notes online somewhere? All of these, again, everything, every PowerPoint and all these are online at no cost from the Ministry of Sailing's website. That's exactly right. Um, again, we want people to start thinking about safety, so we're briefing, we're, you know, we're providing these briefing aids. This one right here is, is the five signs of IDR, or instinctive drowning response. So again, this is the Ameti situation which happened, and this is in a study after the Ameti with the Chicago Yacht Club and U.S. Sailing, where they talk about there's going to be a person in the water, and he just might look okay. You might be talking to them. They might be looking at you with the eyes, but they're in an instinctive drowning response where they can't really move and they can't help themselves. Now, this is critical to train your team, again, what the five signs are for the instinctive drowning response. Because as soon as a person is in the water, if you have a rescue swimmer, that is the moment that the rescue swimmer starts putting on the necessary protection equipment to help them go on. So when you identify somebody who can no longer help themselves, you need to make that call to get that rescue swimmer ready to go into the water and deploy immediately. Because uh, about, an idea uh, Go ahead and finish. Then I'm going to run your video that we, we ran on Perfect. Tuesday because so many people found that useful. Great. So what happens then is um, when a person can no longer help themselves and also an IDR, it could be 10 to 30 seconds that you will no, you will no longer see that person again. Even though he looks okay, he's in a position that he can't help himself. So here you go. Run the video now. Recently, the Coast Guard and other governing bodies have been talking about instinctive drowning response. There are, there are five signs that are distinct that help identify a person that might be suffering from IDR. The first one is their inability to call for help. The second one is their mouth is below the water. The third one is they cannot wave. The fourth is they can't control their arms. And the fifth one is their body is upright. When a person is suffering from instinctive drowning response, it doesn't necessarily always look the same. As a matter of fact, every person who's in the water experienced some sort of distress never has the exact same symptoms so it's going to be important to look for the signs that are leading to the idr response because in idr it might last only 30 to 40 seconds which means you only have 30 to 40 seconds to respond to a person suffering with idr <laughs> their head is going to be low in the water with their mouth very very level to the water almost like the water's at this level and that's all you see. Their arms might be outright in the water, directly like this, all right, directly horizontal to the water. Their arms will be directly horizontal out in the water and their head is gonna be tilted back with their mouth open. Their eyes are gonna be glassy and unable to focus. And one key sign I want you to remember is, it's instinctive for everybody when they come out of the water that they have here, to move their hair out of their face and to get hair or water out of their eyes. 
if the person has water in their eyes and their hair is in their eyes, that is a key sign that they cannot move their arms, which means it's a sign of IDR because their arms are almost paralyzed out horizontally in this instinctive response to try to stay afloat in the water and their body will also be vertical up and down and they will not be using their legs at all. They will also be almost hyperventilating and, hyperventilating and gasping, gasping for air. Okay, I, rather than keeping going on the video, why don't we looking, come back, back to you, John, yours. and yeah. explain the rest of this to us while this video is rolling. Yeah, so, so, so real, really, I think it's really important for everyone, now that this new uh, type of drowning that they're doing the research on has come out, it, it changes, I think, most importantly, the way your team will respond. And it takes away, I think, um, the traditional response, which is don't send a second person overboard. And, 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 and there's arguments on, on, on both ways. Do you send another person in the water or do you not? The, one of the biggest arguments about not doing it um, that we come against uh, is there is um, people say, well, you're, you're doubling the risk of putting a second person in the water. If the person is untrained, if the person doesn't have the proper equipment, and if the crew is not trained in how to utilize the techniques, then I have to say that you're exactly right. However, that's the reason for the certification. And it's not for every boat, it's not for every vessel. Pretty much if your boat um, doesn't go over 10 knots, it probably wouldn't be best for you because your separation from the person in the water, depending on sea safe, isn't gonna be that far. But after 10 knots, and once you're getting into the 20s, you're not gonna see that person for a long time. Once you're getting into the 30s, it's gonna take you a long time to control that vessel all right, to bring it around to find the person in the water. Specifically, if you have, like we just saw, quad head sails. You're running four head sails and you want to get that boat under control, you will not be able to see the person in the water from that distance, which means by the time you get to them or get to them, the likelihood of them being in to help themselves is going to be very, very difficult, no matter what the water temperature is. And these are key points. Yeah, these are key points. You know, we talk about the psychological diminished um, uh, uh, skilled motor. We talk a little about that, you know, in the midst of a crisis, people respond differently. So again, in your briefings, these are the things that you want to have happen when it comes to uh, uh, how to break somebody out of being frozen. I mean, the person might have been your pit man for 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, but they might not have been able to they were at practice dealing with a particular incident where their brain is like, oh my God, I can't believe my, my crew member is in the water. And that's what they're thinking about. All right. So they get fixed on that. That comes from the, the psychological stress, which is happening based on the situation. Some people call it freezing. And there's specific ways we talk about how to get that person back to perform. Because if that person is in charge of the halyard and he's slow on a halyard or he's slow on a jibe or he's slow, whatever his job is, it could jeopardize the, the speed or the readiness or the accuracy of putting that boat or in the retrieval process to bring the person back on board. And so once you see a person who's like that, again, the leadership on the vessel, whether it's a crew, whether it, it doesn't have to be a leadership, a well-trained crew and practice crew in this once they understand this, have the ability to use these three things. Number one, call them by their name. You know, Bob, Joe, look me in the eyes. Get them to refocus, follow commands. Then he's like, using the name again, Joe, I need you to pull out your knife, whatever it's going to be. I need you to release the clutch. I need you to, you know, start grinding, pulling in. So these are the things that's gonna that 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 have to happen, and then again, remind them of what the task is at hand that they're doing. So all of a sudden, you get them back into the routine. This is really really important because in the incidents where I've been around the world or even on the boat, there's sometimes you don't have the exact same crew. People don't know what to do, and they just need direction. But you need to practice, practice, practice. Performance comes from getting things right time and time again. We won't yeah. uh, go again as we into your background and what you do and have been doing in real life, which is hostage, 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 hostage rescue operations in far flung corners of the world. We won't get into all that, but you have a lot of experience in 
similar, although not the same sorts of things, although you're now on the water a lot and you have a lot more experience. Now, do you want to talk about dragging and drowning? Yeah, let's talk about dragging and drowning. Uh, so you can just go to the next one. So with dragging and drowning, again, with four knots of with four knots of uh, boat speed, a person is really in jeopardy of being dragged in, uh, in the water and dragged in such a way that um, it'll end up drowning. Uh, so there's a couple different things on this. First thing, if a person is in the water, like photo below, you probably have your jack line set up wrong. You need to test your jack lines when you set them up so they're center line, mid line of the vessel. Uh, so when people are clipped off, if they slip, if they fall, if they're knocked, they stay on the deck. They're not going over. All right. It takes three to four persons to pull a person back up. So this is what's really important to understand is first prevent it by, by keeping your people on and always use the, the, um, uh, the, the three, uh, point harnesses when it comes to the tethers. So I, I prefer those because one short one's long always keep those clipped in. So if you're moving from one side to another, you have to unclip, you still always have one clipped in. So it's important to use uh, those, those, those three point harnesses or uh, tethers. But what happens then in, in, in the rescue problem, and, and this again, where training comes into a person who's dragging. In most instances, an untrained crew is gonna be reaching down to the person trying to grab the person up. All right, first of all, their body weight and your body weight is inconsistent. You have zero leverage when you're trying to pull a person up, their body weight's down there and they're filled and they're, they're very wet with water, right? And so as you're trying to pull, it's gonna take three to four persons to pull that person back up. But you don't understand that the problem is where that tether is jammed on the jack line, usually on a post or a lock or whatever it's going to be. That's where the problem is. And a trained rescue swimmer and a trained crew will identify that that's where the problem is, get a halyard ready, you will clip that halyard onto the tether, you will cut the jack line, when you cut the jack line, you start hoisting up, and then immediately you've circumvented the problem, and you start hoisting the person up with just a few people. The problem is, if you're untrained, you're gonna have everybody focusing on the individual, looking at the individual, because a person in crisis, you're trying to look them in the face, even though the problem might be three to four to five feet away, that's where the problem is. And so it's really important to understand and under identify to stop a dragging and drown situation. You first have to prevent it from happening first. Second, you have to practice on how to use the hookup, the cut, and then the hoist. Now, what situations, John, would you not use the rescue swimmer? Well, first of all, uh, the situations on the decision-making comes into this. There's three reasons. Well, well, there's a cycle. First of all, a trained rescue swimmer should be on the boat. You definitely want to have a sailing rescue swimmer with a certification on your vessel. That's number one. Number two, the personal protection of the equipment has to be also on the boat to protect the second person in the water. That includes fins. That includes a mask. That includes a helmet. That includes a harness. That includes a, a dorsal harness. And, and this is some of the trade stuff we're talking about now. So basically what happens is you have to have all of that equipment ready and you know we're having bags made so you can just buy that kit, the rescue swimmer kit, you could buy all of that. And then finally, you have to have a trained crew and you have to have practice to do that. And then the situation has to be in such a way that the person can't help themselves and you see that the person truly is in jeopardy. When you have that combination, that's when the instance ha of, of having a rescue swimmer has to be there. If you don't have any of those four, meaning you don't have the trained swimmer, you don't have the equipment, you don't have the uh, um, swimmer, the equipment, you don't have the training, and you don't have, you know, the person's not in jeopardy, then there's gonna be no need to do that. Uh, so that's why the training and the certification is important. And let's remember, when you're certifying people, everybody's being trained to the exact same standard and we're testing for that standard. So no matter where you go in the world with the certification, everyone is trained on how to use the equipment and deal with that. Okay, well, let's talk about the certification. And tell me, is this a money-making thing for you? Is this something that you're going to have liability issues if somebody has a problem and they sue Ministry of Sailing? What about U.S. Sailing? What about the RYA? What about World Sailing? How does that all fit in, if at all? Well, because we are the Ministry of Sailing, <laughs> we're leading the way. Indeed. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, Julie and I, we're big, big supporters of private sector initiatives. And that's what obviously what this is. Have you had resistance yeah. from these of the CCA? You know, we just had Chris Otorowski, who's the Commodore on here, 
not too long ago, and he said, oh, we're looking at it. But again, the, their whole idea and the CC of putting another person in the water seems to them overtly risky. But uh, obviously, in some situations, especially with IDR, it sounds like that's not only necessary, but it's required. I mean, it's, it's yeah, what you I, I agree. I agree that, that it does an untrained person would, would, would double the risk. But a trained person, remember, this exactly. is a technique that's used every single day by some rescue people around the world. And so what we've done is we've take this, we've taken their expertise, we've taken their knowledge, and we've put it into the, our certification program. So the same techniques that are being used in fast water rescues, the same that are being used from helicopters, the same that are being used in ice rescues, these are the same tactics, the same technique, and the same equipment that we're using. Okay, All so right? tell us about the certification process. Okay, so your certification process is this. You can take all the courses, the basic online. You pass a test, and then you'll start scheduling yourself for the on-deck training. Now, if, you, if, if organizations want to host this on-deck training, I'm going to tell you, you want to become the first come, first serve, because we want to work with clubs. We want to work with sailing associations. And so here's what we're doing. Uh, it's going to take money for us to increase our videos. It's going to increase, you know, it's going to take some money for us to increase the professionalism that we're trying to do with the training. All right. So we're going to split any uh, of the profit that comes with the club. We've got a break even point of about six or seven sailors. We get six, and six or seven sailors on a boat. We'll be out there in a minute to start training your teams on the sailing rescue swimmer certification. So the 40% overhead that we keep on the profit stays inside the club. That's it. You host us, you have it. And then the first clubs that host us based on regions will be the only clubs that will do it. So we, I mean, I think it's important to, 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 to reward those who come to the table first. So, so the, 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 the early adopter, if you will, as clubs will become sort of a regional uh, certification center, if you will, and they will continue to get a chunk of the money that is charged to sailors and presumably sailors are interested in doing this. Clubs are interested in doing this. And you say here that U.S. Sailing uh, this fall or last fall in 2022, U.S. Sailing now, is this true? Recommend Obviously it is. You wouldn't put it in your slide. Recommends the training and use of sailing rescue swimmers? Yeah, that's exactly right. So after the last Martin and Marietta incident and the after action review that they did were that, they went from um, the possibility, like if we go back to the Medi, if you read through and, and, and then these incident reports are on our website as well. So you can look at all of them. Um, in the Amedi situation, what U.S. Sailing did is hey, they John, said, hang on, back up because we've got an international audience and and let's remind everybody what that was. It was a TP-52-ish sailing right. in Chicago Yacht Club, Chicago to Mac race, which goes up Lake Michigan. And it was on kind of a rainy, bouncy, not even that windy day, but it was rough. And it was just after the start off of Chicago and a guy fell overboard and they lost him. Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and again, it's Lake Michigan, right? So I think the waves were six to eight, yep. but only five seconds apart, which I mean, you're just getting smashed. I yep. mean, that's what Lake Michigan is. All right. And it was coming up right on the nose. And so in that incident, what us sailing did is they said, there is a possibility in this instant to use a rescue swimmer, just like the professional teams do. So that was the first recommendation that they made. But after the Martin and Marietta, which is the, an, uh, the new port to Bermuda, this incident, then they said it, it, it's important that this be trained now for some sailing vessels. That, so now they've gone to recommending that in some instances, the use of a rescue sailing swimmer is absolutely um, uh, recommended. So subsequent so to Chicago that, Mac, that incident was a couple of years ago. Then this past year, 2022, in the Bermuda race, when the gentleman went overboard, and did they ever find his body? Yep, they were able to recover him. They were and able to recover him, but he had drowned in the meantime. Yeah, one of the issues, one of the issues that's most importantly is they recovered him successfully, but um, again, the use of a rescue sling alone when a person loses consciousness is going to be very, very difficult exactly. to use. Yeah. All right, because you know you have. 90% of the body weight is underneath and a person who's unconscious doesn't have the ability to keep their arms down in the sling. And so it takes a lot of effort when a person 
uh, again when you're pulling up using the rescue swim uh, sling. And one of the things we use is often, often, and if you look into the book, we also recommend that when we're using the, that final hoist of the person on board, that final hoist of the person on board, when it is a situation where you just have a harness underneath their arms, use another tether or three point tethers and you put it also up underneath their legs so you have two points holding the entire body weight and that's one of the things we're also using and this is the exact same technique which is used by rescue swimmers around the world so remind me if if you if you have it at the top of your head who was on those was sally honey for example who were on those committees of note because they were they were both esteemed uh committees that did the reviews for u.s sailing you remember off hand no, I don't. It's all written in the end notes. I think um, in this one particular, the last one, I think Stan was an advisor. He wasn't on the con- committee. I think Stan Honey might have been on the advisor for that. Um, but I think that's how that one worked. But it was, it was since it was Newport Cruising Club, there were a lot of cruising clubs out in Newport. Okay. Uh, but but it's, it's really well done. It's a really good report. Uh, and again, all these reports, are, they're on all the different websites, but we've consolidated this on the Ministry of Sailing website. Okay, let's go to questions because we've got a ton of people on here. We're well over, I don't know, Julia, 100 comments. And in fact, we were even before we got into this segment. So I'm going to start from the bottom. So we're working on these questions about sailing rescue swimmer and certs. Uh, Ken Saban in Toledo, Ohio, saying, I have a million questions for John Schaefer. So fire, fire away, Ken. And then Graham Sweeney, I used the Jacobs ladder system. Uh, you can see the the comments as well, I'm sure, John Schaefer. Uh, Steve yeah, Groover yeah. will also talk to my club about hosting Steve as a senior serious guy in our sport. Uh, Gordon Smith over in Denmark, who's a Brit, but uh, again, a senior serious guy, replying to Stingray, not sure I would want to use a defilibrator in an environment with a lot of salty water or any water around a reasonably reasonable chance of getting a shock myself. Well, that's another topic. Maybe we ask Dr. Mr. Dr. Andrew McIrvin yeah. uh, about that. What other comments, questions? That's, well, that's a good comment on the defibrillator. I mean, I mean the uh, the expectation if you're, you know, fifteen hundred miles offshore to be using a defibrillator the entire time. Um, I don't. I, I think that's the important to have your crew see their doctor before you go offshore. The use of a defibrillator. Make sure that if you are using one, uh, that it is rated uh, uh, for water environment at a boat, uh, because I don't think all of them are. So it could be very risky. And I'll tell you a, a rescue that we did uh, in Africa once. We had a situation where a guy uh, went into AFib during a heart situation, and the people that did the rescue weren't certified with a rescue helicopter. Uh, when the guy coded out, they used a defibrillator. It was a Russian helicopter. It wasn't rated, and uh, all eight people of the crew died because when they used the defibrillator, it killed all the electronics uh, on the helicopter. Oh, so, so it's important that you match the defibrillator with the environment that you're using it. Oh dear. Okay. Well, let me go back. Julia, do you see any burning questions here? Um, I, I'm, I'm just impressed about how needed this is and how open people really are to thinking about it. And they should be. I'm, I think of the times I've been at sea, <laughs> you know. Well offshore. Well offshore. Hundreds of miles offshore. Had you ever discussed any MOB, COB? Oh, yeah. Over? Oh. You had discussed procedures. Yeah. But nothing like this. No. Well, no, it makes a lot of sense. And I can understand how in some situations you would not want to put another person in the water. But in others, especially as we learn more about ID IDR, is that the right? That's correct. Shorthand. Uh, Steve Adkins is saying Bermuda race incident might have had a different outcome on the first pass if they were able to get a rescue swimmer in the water. That's what you're saying, right? That's exactly correct. Yeah. Okay. If the person had the right equipment and been trained, of course, I, I, I think that's really critical to understand. David Lehi, Leahy. Hello, David. Welcome. He's in Nairobi, Nairobi in Kenya on holiday in Oh, he's in, in Columbia, I guess. No. Uh, Steve, great article. I got my rescue handbook and first edition. Ken Saban is saying in Toledo, Ohio. Thank you. Uh, Clayton, Alan Embley, one of the best classes on offshore and, and offshore sailor can take is STCW basic training. That's a presumably Storm Trisel Club basic That's training. That's exactly right. Good point. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's the uh, uh, ST, it's the watch keeping. It's uh, what? It's... You- it's it's the uh, the standard on time of watchkeeping for so, for for offshore. Anybody who works on a vessel or a uh, uh, cruise boat or a private yacht, they need that 
Okay, okay. Yeah. say say again. STWC or STCW stands for what? It's for the standard time and watch keeping. It's it's, it's a standard for all sailors aboard any other vessel. This you is a naval or a a, a, yeah. a mer merchant mariner type situation. That's right. Okay. Well, let's keep going through a few of these other uh, comments. Uh, That's true. Explain all the acronyms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there are some quadri. Okay, so that's most of the questions related to you. We got a lot of questions going back to uh, Sidney Hobart and arguing with the race committee and rating rules and so on. Forgive me if so, I don't so one, don't go back to all thing, those. One one thing I think it's important to add here. Uh, you know, a lot of people I see are making comments about uh, Jacob's ladders and things like that. Y you know, these are all great devices to use, but they're useless if you don't have practice and procedures in using them. Exactly. It's one thing to buy it and put it on your boat, but the f complete understanding on how to utilize it should be come to a, at least an intermediate level, which means you don't always have to think about what you're doing. All right. And if you have to start thinking about it and if you don't know what to do and if you keep doing things wrong, uh, you need to get a little better than that from the basic to move at least into an intermediate understanding. And it's not just for the primary person who drives the boat and rides the boat. It has to be for the entire crew. And especially these conversations have to happen for couples who are usually on their boats, just driving their boats all by themselves. Yeah, good point. The stronger and the weaker individuals need to practice and understand how to get that person out of the water. Yeah, Bill Porter's making the comment, training, training, training. Julie, that's the point you made a minute ago. Right. You know, I now that I sit here and think about it a little bit, growing up on a little pond in Michigan, you know, it's a postage stamp size pond. It was 650 acres. It was a mile by a half a mile, give or take, in the sailing area, a little bit, little bit bigger than that. But I can think of times when I hopped overboard to, because some kid was in the water, had fallen off a boat and, and was in distress, or you wondered if they were in distress. So you hop overboard, grab them. Somebody else is in the boat sailing it around. And at a minimum, you calm them down and you hope they don't drag you down. But you mean, you've got probably a life jacket on yourself. I'm not sure I did. But, you know, this probably applies also to small boats, not just big boats offshore. Yeah, I, th I think it does apply to any type of vessel to understand, you know, what the, the signs of trouble are when these people are in the water. Exactly. Specifically, yes. you have the IDR and the shock. So I think it, it applies there. But one of the things which we didn't expect happening is now we're being approached by some of the larger uh, sailing vessels that have a huge freeboard and catamarans will have a lot of freeboard for this oh, technique. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, one of the vessels is a 180 foot catch. Uh, that they want to get their team certified on. And I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, so, good, good. so so, it makes huge sense, um, not just for racing boats, not just for cruising boats, if you're thinking about it, but also it makes sense for those higher freeboard vessels and even the longer and bigger ones with those freeboards as well. Yeah. Bill Porter, I said, is saying training, training, training. Graham Sweeney up in Yale in Scotland is saying practice, practice, practice. Bill Walker is, it's the inter ICS. T, International Convention on Standards of Training Cert Certification Certification and Watchkeeping for Seafarers. Oh, that's a good thing to know. Okay, good. We yeah. learned something on, uh, this is now Certification Illustrated today. Anyone who I sails anything folks. anywhere ever, Steve Gruber is sailing. Good point. I, I agree with Steve. I think he's seconding what I was saying. Graham Sweeney, I bought my club at an MOB, now COB, Crew Overboard or Man Overboard Dummy, they never used it. They treated it like a joke and gave it to the cadets to play with. Uh -huh. Oh, dear. Alan Long, yeah, redundancy to the third. John, anything else on this topic? And thanks for the excellent presentation before we move. You're going to stay, right? Yeah, I'll stay with you. There's just, I guess the only thing I'd say is, you know, here's the book here. And what's nice about the book is these are briefings, which are, are already canned on there. And it's not paper. So it's made to last on your vessel. <laughs> so Good. you could take it in a water environment, which explains the pricing on it because it's not paper. It's almost, you can't, you cannot rip the pages. And so the back of the, the back of the book has all kinds of briefings material. If you're on a conventional type of MOB turnaround boat, or if you're on a faster boat, uh, specifically if you're doing more than 20 or 30 knots, uh, there's a demonstration and, and a briefing on there. So the briefing tools are all included 
uh, uh, in the in, in in the handbook. So I really thank you for the opportunity. So I'll stick with you guys. Good. Well, please I, do, I, Julia. I think that we are all should take a note that every sailor we know deserves one as a gift. So we next time you wonder what to give a sailor, uh, this is the best thing you can. This you book. Can, yeah. Good point. Now send us one if you would, John. I mean, you said you were going to, but so that I can hold it up from time to time, like an, I can hold up Henry Menon's book uh, called Eric. We had Henry on, as you know, not too long ago. Yeah. Got a nice note from him, Julia, in the last couple of days. Henry, I'll make Anne sure you next week. Please do. John Emmett's got a, in fact, here, uh, proof of the pudding is in the eating, as Shakespeare said. I, I, Emmett is saying, I jumped out of my Ilka, now there's a single-handed boat, yesterday, righted a capsized Ilka, the sailor couldn't get on the centerboard, and then swam back to my boat. Then I saw they couldn't get in the boat, so I jumped in their boat, pulled her into her boat, then swam back to my boat again. Uh. More swimming than I've done in years. <laughs> and in Weymouth, on the south coast of, of England, in January. Uh. <laughs> so, um. yeah, interesting. Uh, Eric, uh, on the on the book, uh, this book, Henry Menon's book, Eric, is on Amazon. What yeah. is Eric's website? I, I don't know that he's done us uh, probably on their Facebook page, you, but it's, you can just get it on Amazon. I've started reading it. It's fun. We're, we're, we're going to be on Amazon soon. Okay. Right. Uh, so that's an interesting point from John Emmett. I, um, I, I mean, that's that. I wonder, John, if he's on here. He was at dinner. Uh, he's obviously on here. He just left that comment. John, did you capsize your own boat so it didn't sail away? How did you handle your boat? Probably a student. <laughs> Replying to Joe Cool, yeah, Steve Gruber saying it's available on Amazon. Okay, Julia, John, um, I'm very impressed with this. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Doesn't yes, it? absolutely. Okay, thanks, Captain Jack. Let's carry on here and go to our next segment, which I wouldn't show either of you in the tech check. So this day in history, sixth of January. I'm not going to talk about what happened. A couple of years ago uh, on Capitol Hill in Washington, <laughs> D.C. that some of you'd like to talk about, probably, not me. Uh, in 1912, the 6th of January, 1912, here is your first clue. Not much of a clue, I know, but yeah. a clue nonetheless. A German professor, Herr Dr. Professor Alfred Wegener. Does that help? 1880 to 1930. So born 30 years after the first America's Cup, AC0 and lived to the ripe old age of 50. He didn't live very long. Well, or, that was a ripe old age then. Well, not really. I mean, a lot of those guys and gals lived to be 70. I mean, look at Queen Vic, how long she lasted. Uh, Almost true. a better part of a century. Uh, here's your next clue. Does that help? What does that look like? Uh, measuring the... the um, uh, Pangea. Continental yeah, Pangea. Drift. Continental Drift. You both had it. This guy was an accomplished meteorologist and pioneer of polar research. He is most famous now for developing and publicizing the theory of continental drift. Nope, Steve. Yeah, Clark Chapin got it. Gordon Smith got it. Uh, Wegener showed that the continents had split apart and drifted away from one another over geological time. And this was hugely, apparently, reading it on Wikipedia today, hugely controversial. Yes. And we've all heard about this before. I didn't realize it was this gentleman. And frankly, I didn't realize it was so recent. Yeah. You know, this was just in 1912 that this guy came up with this. It seems somebody would have kind of, maybe, tectonic plates, yeah, similar. He published his theory in full in his book, The Origin of Continents and Oceans. Can't be anything more sailing related than that in 1915, first presented in 1912, and I guess in a lecture before his book came out. So in this day in history, in 1912, the geophysicist and meteorologist Alfred Wegener presents his controversial theory of continental drift in a lecture at the Geological Association at the Senckenberg Museum in Frankfurt in Deutschland. Mm -hmm. How's that? I'm impressed. You I like that? Yes. I did too. That that's crazy because I just recently heard a statistic that 100% um, uh, of those people in the Flat Earth Society are members from around the globe. <laughs> 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 uh, 
That's like the moron who heard that the, uh, did I, t I, who does, I said this to John saying my, the, the moron who heard that the 90% of all car accidents happen within 10 miles of home. So he moved. So he moved. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Stingray up in Seattle is saying, as a teenager visiting San Francisco, I bought a T-shirt that says, Stop Continental Drift. <laughs> <laughs> Clark Chapin's got it right. Yeah, there wasn't much adoption, tectonic plates and so on, but interesting. Uh, thanks, uh, Ken Saban saying, thanks, John. Be in touch soon, Captain. Uh, Graham Sorry. Sweeney, uh, you need, this is an interesting point, you need to get the relevant associations to take this on board, but I think the designated swimmer scenario will be difficult to get round as the main rule is never <laughs> leave a vessel unless that vessel leaves you. But it's an interesting development and needs looking at. Yeah, Graham, I think we all agree that it's going to be an interesting challenge. Gordon Smith said. It depends on how many times you've fallen overboard. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I think, I think that I think that main rule and most of um, the man overboard techniques these days were built for boats that go under 8 to 12 knots. I think once you're hitting 12 knots, I think you have to start rewriting the rule book. I think yeah, that's a good point. Really good point. And, and back on Emmett's comment, I asked him what he did. He said, my Ilka capsized as soon as I jumped out of it, but it was slowly drifting away for me. A good reason to be very close and then swim fast afterwards. Okay, we'll carry on. And John's going to stay with us. Thank you, Captain Jack. As we are uh, an hour and 13, almost hour and 14 minutes into our show number 581 for Friday, the 6th of January, the 12th day of Christmas. Time to take the decorations down and a preview as we promised in the show notes uh on uh this race starting on sunday this is uh, the rorc's transatlantic race and the forecast talk about champagne conditions the forecast at least for the early stages of the race look fantastic looks like they're going to have a record breaking run the new year heralds a big season for the rorc including the 14th it's not the 14th i had to I read else, elsewhere that it's the ninth, and indeed it is the ninth edition of the ROC Transatlantic Race, the longest race in 2023. ROR, ROC Seasons Points Championship starts from Marina Lanzarote on January 8th, of two days' time. Thanks, to Andrew McIrvin, for helping me to sort this out. Andrew will be with us next Tuesday, as I mentioned. Near perfect record conditions are forecast for the start in the Calero Marinas and the International Maxi Association, of which Andrew is the Secretary General, as you all know, and the Yacht Club de France. The international fleet is set to depart Lanzarote on Sunday. Weather forecasts are predicting five days or more of 20 knot plus northeasterly. So a nice starboard broad reach down toward Guadalupe. Weather forecasts are predicting, as I said, a perfect angle for high speed 3,000, the 3,000 mile race across the Atlantic Ocean. There is the course. And Andrew is headed down there, I think, after Tuesday's show. He's not there for the start, but he will be there for the finish. And he, as I said, will be our guest. Talking about a lot of things, by the way, not only this race. Uh, of the RRC's race, but also we're going to talk about 2023 offshore racing in general, what's on tap. We're going to talk, of course, about COVID and the new variants and some of the new advice. And should you get, a Julia, a fourth or even fifth vax? Should I, who's now had it, get a vax? And if so, how soon? And, yeah. and the advice is once again all over the proverbial map. It is. John, are you vaxxed? I refuse to comment on my medical situation on a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Well, we will get uh, Mr. Dr. Andrew McIrvin on to talk about this race and more. Uh, this starts Sunday, and you can watch the boats, as usual, YB Tracker, what used to be called Yellow Brick Road or Yellow Brick Tracker. will be doing a superb job, I'm sure, as usual. Ed Worley is saying you're smart. John, for not discussing me. <laughs> Thumbs up, Thanks, smart. Sir. Yeah, sorry. Hey, oh, I just I want to give a little just uh, lead into this clip. This is the navigator. This is uh, uh, the navigator of Jazzy, and he's got the kind of the insight into the weather and what is the what is the weather routing therefore. 
Yeah, so this year is looking at a very stereotypical trade wind route. They're very well established. Um, what we have are two high pressure zones effectively to the north of the rum line. Um, so that pushes us south to get some more wind speed to get us moving. A um, little bit tricky the first 36 hours. Got to uh, get around Tenerife and then avoid the wind shadows uh, behind Tenerife. Tenerife's uh, 3,500, 3,700 meters tall. So uh, I need to get south without getting caught in the wind shadow before we can then start getting west. And then probably what we'll do is we'll come, you know, was this first high pressure rolls through, we'll look to try and get north and hook into some, uh, some of the uh, east northeasterly and uh, put a drive in so we can use that to our advantage and start heading back down to the rum line and, and south into, into Grenada. That's Tom Robinson. He's uh, not from Malta. He's a Brit, or so I'm told, and I checked with Andrew on that. I don't know if you say Jazzy or J JC Jossy. I suppose Jazzy. Yeah. Uh, the Maltese big uh, swan 115-footer. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's a 110, yeah, close to it. Yeah, a big boat. And a cool Should boat, cool-looking boat. Here's another look, bow on, of the same boat. It's one oh, of the – Oh, big. Yeah, it is one of the favorites to be first to finish. There are 21 entries racing under IRC and MOCRA, MOCRA rating rules for the multi hulls, are confirmed for the transatlantic race. Three 70 foot trimarans, Maserati, Snowflake, and Zulu, will be gunning for the outright race record in multi hull line on yours, on oars. Uh, three fully crewed maxi yachts can be counted as favorites for the IMA transatlantic trophy, which Andrew will be there to present. For a monohull line honors, it is a Swan 115, Jazzy or Jay-Z, Jazzy, and two Volvo yeah. 70s. Your boat, John, I Love Poland, and Green Dragon at the other yeah, end um, of the spectrum. Yeah, that's uh, Sailing Poland is the one I'm I, I'm more associated with, uh, which is the Volvo 65. That's going to be a good race between uh, the Volvo 70s, though, Green Dragon, and, uh, and I Love Poland. I love I love Poland has got a really great crew with Gregors. He's he he's the helmsman on that one, and Johannes is going to be on on the Green Dragon. Uh, that's going to be a good race. I'm looking at seven days maybe for these guys, seven or eight days. Uh, it's going to be great to see how they how they they chase each other on the course. It could be a five day for the trimarans. And thank you, race. and thank you, Andrew Pindar. Did I say Guadalupe? It's obviously it's Grenada. We knew that. And uh, thank you for correcting me. Is Steve Gruber is asking is Jossie, Jazzy, 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 the old fling. Do you know that? I am unsure. It could be, actually. Um, it, I think it might be the Highland Fling 4, maybe. It could be, actually. I'm unsure. I, I, I'll bet you it is. Okay, and thanks for that correction, Andrew Pindar. Uh, tell, tell us, what's your connection to Poland? I love Poland. That boat, that uh, VO70. Oh, I just race against them. It's sailing Poland, so there's two out of Poland. One is sailing Poland, and the other ah, is I ah, love so. Poland. Ah, so. so one is a Volvo 65, and the other one is a Volvo 70. On the 65s, I did a lot of training with them, a lot of support with them uh, as well, uh, mostly for the Caribbean down there. Um, and I don't, you remember COVID, right? Well, there was a time because uh, of Tylaska, which is a, a, a great piece of equipment utilized on any uh, big rig vessel today. You have a, 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 a Tylaska, which is a load opening um, shackle. So you can you can release it under load. Yep, um, yep, yep. There was a time uh, I owned every T30 in the world, <laughs> which, which means I owned eight of them. <laughs> 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 and, and and so uh, I, I worked a lot with them with support with uh, when they're redeveloping the vessel and then sailing on it in the Caribbean with them for the last two years. So the the seven, the VO seventy is the boat that you sailed on that's in this race. I sailed on both of them. Oh, I'm did. more associated with the sixty five. The sixty five is going to be uh, in the import race in Alicante. Right. That, so the uh, six, on, that's on, so that was Sunday. my confusion. We were talking yeah. in the tech check about how could that boat be doing this race and still be doing the in. So there's two different boats. One's a VO seventy. One's a VO sixty five. That that explains that. Yeah. So that's um, at the other end of the spectrum. The last sentence here: three teams will be racing with the added challenge of competing in the IRC double-handed. So again, there's a good double-handed. This is getting bigger and bigger in our sport. Seems like, seems like a good trend. 
An impressive list of the world's most accomplished and celebrated sailors includes Kenny Reed, our longtime friend, who will be racing, and president of North Sales, who will be racing on the Swan 115 Jazzy, skippered by Toby Clark. Reed will be taking part in his 12th transatlantic in an illustrious career, which includes three round-the-world races. So it's nice that Kenny's on that boat. And again, a longtime friend. Here's a quote from him. The key goal for Jazzy is that the owner, and I love this, and several of his friends are doing the RRC Transat as a bucket list race. Mm -hmm. They've never done anything like this before, so we will make sure it stays safe and that they have a blast, unquote, commented Ken Reed. Quote, we have a great crew with a lot of experience, and it's going to be fun for us to show them the ropes. Jazzy has a great twin rudder steering system and a big sail plan, but we have to be smart and slowly work ourselves into fifth gear. Be fun watching them do that. John, anything on that? Yes, I wish I was on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> can he call me if you need a rescue swimmer? <laughs> <laughs> no. He probably does. Well, um, it, go, it goes on here. The uh, double, Speaking of the double-handed now, this is one of the favorites in the double-handed division. Sun, it's a Sunfast 3300 called Sea Bear, and it's a, a father-son duo, Peter and Duncan Bacon. They'll be racing this yacht Sea Bear in double-handed. Sea Bear has plenty of racing miles under her keel as the duo took part in seven ROC races this past season, and this is their third year campaigning the boat. Corinthian Peter Bacon, being an amateur, Corinthian Peter Bacon already has one transatlantic race win in his impressive CV, winning IRC2 as skipper of XP40, the XP44, Lucy Georgina in the 2019 West East Transatlantic race. And here he is with his son, father-son duo of Duncan on the left, Peter Bacon, the owner skipper. I guess they'll both be skippering. They live in Connecticut, Andrew McIrvin tells me, a British at least dad, I don't know if the kid's an American or a Brit, but uh, Brits nonetheless living in Connecticut, apparently. So we're looking forward to that race, which starts on Sunday from Lanzarote and goes to Grenada, not whatever that crouton said a minute ago. That it was, it was, <laughs> why are you on? laughing? Because <laughs> I, I wouldn't have known anyway. <laughs> so. Well, that's why we have smart people on here like the Fosey, including McIrvin and... Right. Pindar, thank God. Indeed. Hey, 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 Tom. Um, on on the uh, um, double handed. Yeah. You're seeing you're seeing more and more purpose built boats these days for these double handed races now. Indeed. Uh, so, so you're so now you have manufacturers that are looking at it. and what's neat about it it's a pretty good price point for offshore racing for one but number two they're purpose built so everything's going to be really far aft so it's going to be easy to set a spinnaker it's easier to have the lines come around one of the boats that i'm really impressed with recently is the new x2 that came out by far so far has an x2 which is basically a 34 foot volvo ocean race boat which is just unbelievable with water ballast this is the boat to look out for that's going to be a super fast boat coming in the near future. Yeah. Okay. Clark Chapin is saying, think Grenada, the one we invaded, not Granada, the city in Spain. Mm -hmm. they, in the Caribbean, they pronounce it Grenada. Okay. Now another preview starting tomorrow, the village opens. We were telling you on Tuesday that the fleets, the two fleets were assembling in Alicante in south of Spain for the final run towards the start of the ocean race, which is the 15th, Sunday, the 15th. So the ocean race, it's a little uh, thin, has five Amokas, which are not going around the planet. Well, the, sorry, the Amokas are, the VO65s are not, six VO65s. And they have assembled, all 11 boats are now there. And I wonder if Pindar is there because he was, I think, going down for the start of that race eventually. And there are the, the pictures they released just before we went to air of the village and of the boats lined up there in uh, Alicante Bay or Harbor, whatever it's called. Saturday, tomorrow, the village opens for TOR, the ocean race. And then they have an import race on Sunday, which we'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. But here is their round the world stopping point, the round the world schedule and course for the Imokas.
I probably, I probably should have voiced that. Let me give them the final slide there. Probably should have voiced that because there are a lot of memories in there. Do you see the, you, you were there. Itajai. Well, Itajai, we've talked about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Your late great husband, uh, Julia, used to run big ships down there for right. Hamburg Sud and Correct. whoever else. But did you see the green unis of a certain a winning team from what was the Volvo Ocean Race? Oh. That you and your husband supported, who was skippered by a guy from St. Francis Yacht Club. There was a picture of them in there. Uh huh. Of Kostecki's team. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, my, my, my guys. Your guys. Remember that? Yeah, indeed. And, you know, there's obviously they're going down to see Ted Ryman in Cape Town yeah. after they stop at, at Cabo Verde, at Cape Verde. And they will go down and see Ted Ryman uh -huh. in Cape Town. And Ted always gives us pictures and goes down to the village and so on. So it'd be nice to have that. Then they're skipping. Australia, New Zealand, China, you know, the pirate, yeah. the pirate fest infested waters and so on. So they're going straight over past the Cape and up around to Itajaí. Yes. That's a long leg. It is. And then it's up like to a, Newport and 8,000 miles or something some, like that. Something crazy. like that. And then, the uh, leg uh, and then, uh, up to Newport and, uh, I may try to get to Newport. I may dash out there. And if Julie, if you're up and if your legs are functioning and foot is fully repaired, maybe get you there too. But be great. I Brad Reed, I'll get him on the show at some point. Kenny's younger brother and long, long time friend. Yeah, Clark Chapin saying that is a long leg. Uh, yeah, and Stingray's asking who, and of course Stingray either was born in or spent some time in as a kid in Cape in Cape Town, and yes, the Cape to Rio race started when John. Couple uh, that started last weekend, right? And um, yeah, because yeah. Ted Ryman sent me a couple pictures, and Andrew mentioned it. Uh, yeah, started on January second, so I think it's it's not quite over. But uh, Stingray saying my late dad raced in it twice. It was rough. Yeah, that can be a rough race mm -hmm. too. So if you're wondering how to watch the ocean race and this thing we've just seen the, the around the world, then Newport, and then this whole thing in Europe. And then they're end. I like that they're going back into the med and ending in Genoa. That will be, I think, quite interesting with, with the flybys and so on. The stop in Den Haag. Yeah. But you can follow. Look at they they pu published today a long thing on how to follow the race to give people who are covering it the television companies and so on. But it's very simple. How to follow the ocean race 2022 23. No other sporting event gets its fans as close to the action. This is a pretty bold claim. Gets its fans as close to the action as the ocean race, and there are multiple ways you can follow the competition throughout the six month event. Well, let me tell you the simplest, easiest way to do that is to go to the YouTube channel of Eurosport. Eurosport's covering a lot of it on the Eurosport channel. And by going to their YouTube channel anywhere in the world, you can see it. This I pulled off uh, this screen grab from a couple hours ago but it is going live on the 8th for the import race in Alicante at 0500 here mm -hmm. on the West Coast. And you can do the math for the rest of the world. That uh, is 1300 UTC, eight hours uh, after or be eight hours to us, to the East. And again, that race starting in Alicante and working its way around the world in that long leg from Cape Town, Oh. Does it say the length? Somebody yeah. said it was nine. I think John just said it was eight thousand miles. Yeah. But it's I'm, a I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going from memory. It's a long leg, and then up through Europe, Den Haag, and finally into the Med, back uh, finishing at Genoa, not Alicante. And this is the Amoca route. The Ocean Race will visit nine iconic international cities over a six-month period, with leg one starting from Alicante on Sunday, the 15th. That's a week from this Sunday. And of course, also this coming weekend is Sail GP's next event. That will be in Singapore. This is not a picture of that. This is just, I don't know if the sun is setting on this race. This is obviously a sun setting photo. Uh, it's, I say it's obvious. I know Alicante, having lived in Valencia and been down there to Benidorm and Alicante. Uh, I don't know if the sun is setting on this race or not. I hope not. It's got a long and storied tradition, starting out as the Whitbread, of course. And I just wonder what you think, John. Uh, 
we're going to have this import race for the VO 65s, not the Amokas. And then it's the Amokas that are going to go around the world. So the VO 65s are just going to do the so-called sprint cup. They're going to go from here, from, from Alicante yep. down to uh, Cape, Cape Verde. And then they're going to stay in Europe, go back to Europe and do the other sprint races. They're not going to go around the globe with the Amoka. So it's a little sad. I wonder if they ought to go back to the same formula that made the Whitbread so popular and just do, tell me what, IRC in two or three divisions and, you know, you know, run what you brung. Bring any boat that meets a certain size and certain rating. What do you think? Well, I, I, I like the one design concept of, uh, of the Volvo 65. I mean, it's a great package. It's a fast package. It's stronger than the Volvo 70s. Um, so, so for me, I'd like the one design because I think it's easier to control and manage the race altogether from all aspects, even when the marketing comes to it. I think the biggest problem they're having is some of the marketing that's going on right now and the loss of money. I mean, I mean if I think teams had the sponsorships, um, uh, they would, there would be more in there but I'm not seeing the sponsorships hit and they're having difficulty getting it in the funding. And I think that's why you're seeing the Volvo 65s doing the sprint cup, not yeah. because of their lack of will. I think it's because of lack of funding. Yeah. Well, for sure. And, and then uh, people to watch is, you know, you got Bao Becking on team Zhao Zhao with Sinbad. Uh, that's going to be a team. Uh, this is his eighth or ninth. I can't remember, but he hasn't won yet. So you got Bao on team Zhao Zhao with the Dutch team. And then you have Liz Wardley is back on Sailing Poland. Yep. The, Sailing Pol the Sailing Poland team also has um, the, the owners of the vessel Sons on board. One of them is 19. This will be the youngest kid ever to do uh, any of the Volvo Ocean races. Cool. Uh, some comments. Steve Gruber asking, how long was the China to Itajaí? Like, did they ever go China to Itajaí, or was it China stopping in either, well, stopping in Auckland and then Itajaí? Did they ever go China all with, without stopping in the Antipodes? I don't remember that. I uh, only remember them coming down from China to New Zealand. So usually it was Australia, China, then New Zealand, and then Itache. Yeah, John Emmett, Ligia, his little Lily Zhu is following the ocean race. Uh, and by the way, I saw the, thank you, Ted Ryman. He's put the link to the live tracker for the Cape, Cape Town Rio race. Thank you, Ted, for that, Cape, Cape Town uh, domiciled, Britt, Ted Ryman, a long time Fozzie, right from the get go, almost, he was one of the first six years ago, Julia, mm -hmm. and a character that he is. Uh, Sing race told an interesting story about Namibia and sailing <laughs> off Africa. Um, uh, so Andrew Pindar, are you telling Steve Gruber, Hong Kong to Itajaí was about 13,500 miles. Wow. And was that nonstop at Clark Chapin saying 12,200 miles? Didn't they stop though? Did they go nonstop? Don, Don Lunabo saying 12,750. So round about 12 to 13,000 miles. Um, John Sangmeister's on is saying, run what you brung. Three glasses for 60, three classes, I think he means, for 60, 70, 100 footer, 10 countries, individual awards, and an Admiral's Cup win for the team, the country team. What a good idea. Mm -hmm. So he agrees. What What else? Julio, would you like that race? No. <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> I, I like, I love watching it on, 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 and as they uh, encounter all their adventures. Well, I'm not saying would you like to go in it, but the idea of going back to a handicap race, oh. three different classes, yeah. run what you brung. What do you think, <laughs> Cap, Captain Jack? I th he does. I think if it's. I think if it's 12,000 miles, somebody better bring a fishing pole. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope they like sushi. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying in future for the round the world race, instead of uh, trying to do one design boats or the, the I mean, the Amoka class can stay. They do the, if this turns out to be a success, there aren't many Amokas racing in this, given the size of the, of the global fleet now of Amokas getting ready to do yeah. a Vande Globe I, and so on. Again, I think it's about the sponsorship. It's about, it's about raising the money to do the race. I mean, things are really expensive these days. Uh, so um, I think that's one of the issues we're running into. Well, and run uh, run with respect, the money. Run, run what you brung is less expensive than having to buy, build, rent some kind of a new boat. Sure it is. I understand that that's absolutely correct. And then you get into a rating system at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, my, you know my feelings about that. I do. 
<laughs> but and remember, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Well, <laughs> if you ain't rubbing, you ain't racing. <laughs> As they say in NASCAR, Sunday is the first VO65 import race in Alicante. I hope the race, the sun is not going down in this race. I'm sure it's not, but I, I think a lot of us think that they need to change the format one way or another. That gets us about an hour and 40 minutes into today's show number 581. Julia, getting close wow. to 600 shows. Oh, good heavens. Maybe we should turn this over to Captain Jack. He yes. Could, he could take this over. He should do this. He's a pretty good on technology and pretty good with all this stuff. He is. Um, shall we look at the America's Cup, guys and gals? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so there's one video that I saw, pretty quiet. They're starting to get back in action, though. And the first one, as far as I can tell, back in action for training leading up to AC37 is Quantum Racing American Magic, New York Yacht Club's okay. team. My name's Andrew Campbell. I'm a flight controller and sailor on board. Okay, we went offshore again today. Uh, how'd it go out there? Oh, we had an amazing day offshore today. Um, you know, we've been putting a priority on making sure we're in conditions that look like Barcelona, and, and uh, I think outside of Pensacola is about as good as we can get. So uh, we, had a, we had a really nice nice day of sailing, finally. Um, first first sessions of the new year, you know, the priority is to get outside, and there we were. So you take the, the conditions outside today were similar to what we see in Barcelona? That's for us to find out, I suppose. It's certainly closer to it outside than it is inside here in Pensacola, but um, you know we make the most of it regardless of what, where we're gonna sail. Um, outside here, it gives us a little more bump. It gives us that kind of random sea state that we think we'll probably see in, in, Pen in Barcelona. Was there a specific focus today going offshore? Um, no, I mean, you know, there's a lot going on with the systems. There's a lot going on with the sail plan. Um, you know, there's a lot going on with the foils all the time, anytime we go out sailing that we're learning about. And we're always kind of it, with the lens of a new venue. So, uh, you know, now more than ever, any chance we get to go and, and be in a venue here that looks as close as it's going to be for the match, you know, that that's, that's ideal for us. So um, now that we're kind of changing our, you know, how we frame our day of sailing, that's, uh, that's the priority is to go into a sea state that looks more similar to what we think it'll be like in the Mediterranean. Okay. Uh, were there any breakages today? We saw some guys looking at the portfolio. Yeah, um, no, nothing abnormal more than, you know, any normal stuff that happens on a day of sailing. You know, these boats get pushed pretty hard and um, they are performance oriented. You know, they're, they, ha they have to be reliable enough to get us around the racetrack in a race, but they have to be uh, pushed to the edge enough that, that we're pushing the performance envelope. So, um, you know, nothing beyond what we would normally see. What was going on with the portfolio? Uh, you know, those basically the one design foil arms are are um, a piece that we need to deal with. You know, um, with, a, with fairings on the front half and the back half of the foils, and so um, where those intersect and how those all work together. You know, where the one design piece and where our piece work. Um, that's a constant state of of uh, consternation for us. We're always looking for for um, ways to to figure that out, and um, you know, finding those intersections is looking at those intersections, making sure everything looks right, and looks like we expect them to, that's a, that's a high priority for us. So no epiphanies on how we're gonna make that um, you know, work yet. We're always always looking for good solutions. How does, uh, what changes in flight control when you go from, from inshore to offshore? Well, um, you know, inshore here, like in Auckland, it's kind of a mill pond, you know, it's a flat, um, generally pretty easy place to go sailing from a flight control perspective and uh, when the sea state, um, you know, gets added on top of that, you're um, dealing with a, a, a whole other animal. And when a sea state like today, where it was kind of off center, off off axis, um, it's uh, it's pretty challenging for for anybody doing it, you know, and much less you know some of us who've had a couple years of experience doing it. So we're learning it all over again every time we go out. What's the biggest opportunity going forward with regard to offshore sailing? Uh, I think that every time we go out there, we're learning something. So it's a it's a big priority for us. You know, we see. Lingy in the venue, you know, doing that, and that's a, a good motivation for us to, to go out and, and hack into it. We see Luna Rosa going out in, in bigger sea states, and we know that, um, you know, we need to be kind of prepared for that and ready when we get to the Mediterranean. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, guys. Well, I almost didn't play that video because the audio is so croutonic, as several of you said. So Ted Ryman saying somebody was backing up a long way. <laughs> a long way. Did you see that yes. comment? Uh -huh. 
Alan Long, is that backup horn for Hetzel changes? <laughs> American <laughs> magic. If you don't learn anything, what's the point of going out? Yeah, I, I, Bill Wingrove, the questions here are croutonic. We went outside looking for conditions like Barcelona. They did, but you know, this is, I don't think it was their first day, actually, it was their second day. I may have had it wrong in the show notes, but that beep, beep, beep was irritating. And Bill Wingrove is correct. Okay, well, it gives you an update. They are back on the water. Uh, that is another one of these centralized AC 37. Uh, recon videos that a team of people are producing centralized. And if they would please get the audio correct, please fix the audio. It would be a big help. I'm sure. I mean, you're sitting there. I won't play another one like that. I promise. Uh, that gets us to what I call as a new segment that I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying, especially this painting. And I'm calling it the last leg before we get to the finish line. And this painting, which I, I just Googled today, Last Leg Sale, and up came this painting from 1982 called The Last, Last Leg to Gloucester, Mass, Massachusetts, by an artist called Thomas Hoyne, who lived from 1924 to 1989. So late in life, he painted this. Uh, this painting of the mackerel saner, sane being, of course, the big net, the Harry L. Belden, really captures the power of the big schooners when in a good breeze on the point of sail that best favored the rig. The lee scuppers are boiling, and occasionally the rail is submerged up to the dead eyes. If not at the helm, the best place to be while sailing like that is crouched down on the lee side of the house, admiring the curve of the sails, quote-unquote. That from a gentleman I don't know, but that Bobby Hall on the Maritime Art Facebook group. <laughs> and you know what? These Facebook groups are getting bigger and better. And better. And oh, the, yeah. the biggest and best, I think, is sailing. And they sailing very kindly always shares our show or allows me to share our shows to sailing. And there's Facebook Yacht Club and there's a few others, but, you know, they're a little more kind of restrictive. But sailing likes anyone and everyone putting stuff up. Mm -hmm. And they put a lot of images up, and now they're sharing them to my Sailing Illustrated Facebook page, which I love because some yes. of the, that's how I found this thing. Mm -hmm. And this uh, Maritime Art Facebook group is fantastic. I scrolled through it, thumbed th you know, through it a little bit today, and there are some amazing paintings and pictures on there. Morris Stevens, who's up in that part of the world, up in Nova Scotia, there is nothing like it, indeed. Okay, yeah, and Julie Aaron's back on this America's Cup. The interviewer needs to do his or her uh, homework, yep. I, I don't know, Gordon Smith, when American Magic are moving to Barcelona. And <laughs> Clark Chapin wondering, why don't you call that more Vang? Well, they, they probably didn't want more <laughs> Vang for, <laughs> for a number of, of reasons. Jack, anything on that? Yeah, I would put the uh, lifeboat, which has to weigh at least 2,000 pounds, at least on the high side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, almost the lifeboat almost looks like it's on gimbals. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't intentional, but you, you are, so instead of instead of tacking sails, you're going to tack the lifeboat? <laughs> on these... Yeah, well, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the racing sailor that you are. Okay, well, that's the last leg, and I in the last leg segment here, our new segment, I'm going to do a Bravo Zulu. And this, uh, thanks to one of our foes, a dear friend of John Emmett's, coming from Australia, this video of the cadet world just wrapped up. Yes, it's my last event in cadets. I've been in cadets for like eight, eight years now. So yeah, it's, it's, it's sad to be going, but it's got to start a new, new chapter in my, in my life. Yeah, it's, it's really nice to see all like the people out because because of COVID, we haven't seen all the Australians in years. So it's been really good to catch up and just been able to see everyone. And just, it's nice to be in our winter in a nice hot place when it's minus five at home. The cadets, I think it's just such good fun with all the friends you make. And yeah, well, the main thing is just enjoy it, enjoy what you do. But yeah, cadets are just all the friends you make all around the world. And I just think it's the best boat to sail for all juniors.
I started Sailing Cadets when I was nine years old and so it's been a quite a long journey. I think that was my eighth nationals that we just done. So it's nice to finish on a final note at the World Championships and just getting to meet lots of other people who are like me and enjoy sailing. And one of my favorite parts of this class is just sort of the idea of mentoring. Like I started as a crew and I looked up to the older skippers and then I traveled into being an older skipper who looked after the younger crews. And I, I think that journey is quite special. And this, everyone is like such good people in cadets. Like, I love my friends. To tell you the truth, when I first started sailing, I like hated it so much. I started crewing in the middle of winter. It was cold and windy and I cried the whole time, but I wanted to hang out with my friends afterwards. And I think so many people start sailing cadets because of that and then learn to love racing. And yeah, it's a nice community. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's a lot of fun. I don't know, I'm gonna miss sailing. I've had, this is Chloe, my crew is the third person I've sailed with. Um, I obviously crewed with my skipper Emma, then I had a crew Charlie, and then I have Chloe, and I just love the teamwork and that sort of connection that you build with your crew. Like, um, yeah, I just bounce ideas off them, we sing on the way in, and then it's a lot of fun, and I'm gonna miss that a lot. Buddies for yeah. life. Eh? Buddies for life. <laughs>I just think that is a joyous video and Neil Collingridge sent that to me and I don't know, he does PR for the class. So he may have shot that John Emmett may know, uh, probably will know if, John, if uh, Neil also, who's been on the show with John, whether he also shot and edited that video, but that Julia, you laughed. Yeah. You big smile. Julia, you had an ear to ear smile when yeah. that, that girl said, I used to hate sailing it. <laughs> I started in the winter and it was cold and I, I hated went, it, and then I and then it got warm, and I got to go racing with my friends or something. No, no, and the only reason I continued was for the party afterwards. Well, was that what she said? No, I mean, not in those words, but, but fantastic <laughs> stuff. And and there's a big debate, as you see in the comments, about what that looks like. It looks like a small lightning or an inner lake that went through the dryer and shrunk. <laughs> to, to me, John uh, Julia, it looks. Yes, Groover says it looks like a lightning. Um, what are the other comments here? To me, it looks a bit like an optimist. You know, it's got that squared off bow. It looks like an optimist that has grown. And as, as McIrvin said, it's, you know, you learn to sail with three sails. Yeah, that's, that, that's an important part. Of which that. is what the Blue Jay was in, uh, you know, the Blue Jay is a small lightning that was a junior trainer for a long, long time on Long Island Sound. A lot of kids grew up with, I never did, but we were sailing our parents' boats, uh, the bigger boats, because that's all we had and we were poor. But there yeah. were lots of terrific comments. Stingray, my first boats went Optimist, Mirror, Fireball, Laser. Yeah, I had sailed a Fireball too. An opt yeah, Clark Chapin, an Optimist that grew up. It looks to me a little bit like that. Andrew, I think, what, what here, Andrew Pindar said, replying to Andrew McIrvin, which goes to prove how through the dint of a little work and plenty of good looks, anyone can go from cadet to admiral, then, then Mr. Dr. Andrew McIrvin, because McIrvin said earlier that the first boat he sailed was a cadet. Yeah, lots of cool comments. Emmett saying, I yeah. used to coach the cadet <laughs> South Zone squad for many years. Now those kids have their own kids in the Ilka Four. So Emmett must be getting old. <laughs> and, and as Andrew's saying up there, and you learn about three sales, not just one. Yes. Uh, Gordon Smith never sailed one. Uh, I think I missed something. Yeah, it looks like a cool boat, Steve Gruber, doesn't it? Mm. Okay, thanks for that video. And John Emmett, if you see Neil, I don't see him on here, but if you see him before I do, I'll, I'll send him a note. But thank him very much for sending the, the video. And I, I wonder again if he shot that and edited that cool video. Gets us uh, to the D block here as we're headed for the finish line. And I have a Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. And...
This really is also a correct or croutonic. Now, so I, I know some of you don't like this. Gordon Smith doesn't like as I beat on about, but, but I don't know if you call them the Wussexes or the sec, excesses. <laughs> but this, this was sent by one of our Fozzy, and he said, now here's an idea for a Netflix documentary. <laughs> And uh, Captain Jack, you know who that is on the left, of course. Uh, yeah, and the right. And you know who that is on the right. Well, that was sent by our uh, esteemed Mr. Dr. Andrew McIrvin, and he sent a bunch of others. He sent a bunch of others. And that's the only one I ran because I didn't want to get Gordon Smith and some of the others who think I go overboard with these. And I think they are absolute croutons. But explain to us... Uh, Julia, you laughed and laughed about this when I told you who that was on the right. Yeah, I didn't know. Captain, I mean, I, Captain I didn't Jack, tell, tell Julia who that is. Well, she now knows. Oh, that, I know. Who that is on the right and what the significance is. Yeah. Is, is that the bodyguard? <laughs> <laughs> John and Emmett says, way, yes, there is a strong resemblance. <laughs> I do not recommend pissing off any redhead, by the way. So I'm, <laughs> <laughs> says he from experience, I know. <laughs> Well, it's just, it's a little much. I, I, I'm not going to dwell on this, but I'm not going to read the book. I'm not going, I'm not going to watch the, the video, but it's fun to talk about it. And all the people that are sending us the memes, most of which are just hilarious. And I could have done a whole show about the memes about these two croutons. Okay, enough said. Uh, those of you who don't know, this is the purported father of that. Supposedly he had, well, he did. I guess it's well widely acknowledged he had a fling. This, of course, James Hewitt. Was that her bodyguard? Is that what he was? Yes, it was. Had a fling with uh, the late great Princess Diana, and the the resemblance is uncanny. Mm -hmm. Talk about ski jump noses. Bob Hope should, should be worried. Our late great comedian Bob Hope, whom I met, huh? Major James Hewitt. John Emmett is saying, okay, mm -hmm. enough of that. Correct or croutonic? I don't know. I don't care who the father was, but I, 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 it's, I feel bad for the queen, Her Majesty, the late great queen. Uh, that gets us to the finish line. I love this photo. I'm going to keep using it from the 2018 Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. And Julie, before you wrap up, we'll go to John and see if he has any other comments. No, thoughts, just final don't... thoughts. Yeah, people are talking about uh, what their first sailboats were. They've all missed the opportunity to be on the MC Scows and the Scows from the Midwest. Those are the only ones to learn how to go fast on. You know, that's a great point. <laughs> and you know what is uh, this year is the 100th anniversary of the? Scout. Yeah, East Scout. The Scout. The East Scout. Yeah, and East the Scout. East, the e is, uh, we're going to celebrate it later in 2023. They're going to have a big national championship at, um, not Lake Mendota, maybe Lake Mendota. I can't remember now. Uh, my sister had lunch with Hewitt when he came to Cape Town, right? I'm say he denies being Harry's dad. Well, he would. He was a cavalry officer. Mr. Dr. Andrew McIrvin, who sent me that picture. He was a cavalry officer, not a bodyguard. Well, And Pindar saying the same thing. Yeah. He was not a bodyguard. Okay. Cavalry officer. Well, that, 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 must have been, that must have been the other guy then. <laughs> 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 Now Gordon Smith's really going to be mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Jack. Much appreciated. Thank well, you, everyone. I really appreciate it. And keep us posted as this uh, this sailing rescue swimmer thing develops, and uh, we'll get you back on again sometime sooner than later. Yeah. Hey, folks. Thanks a lot. And we're looking for hosts. We'll be at your club. All you got to do is call us. I, I'll talk to the powers that be at St. Francis, for example. That'd be awesome. Okay. Ciao for now. Ciao. Thanks. Uh, that brings us, Julia, to your witness. Oh, there's always so much going on. It is, it is fun to look at the, the breadth and depth of stuff that's going on in, in the sailing world. Like, follow, and share? Like, follow, and share. Yeah, that is indeed the thing to do. And if you are so inclined, you may comment, even in replay, because we leave the comments open. Uh, Alex Kent, thank you very much for the invitation. I sent you an email yesterday afternoon. I am not able to race, sad to say, in the Corinthian Yacht Club Midwinters, January 21, 22. I, thank you. I appreciate the invite. And I sent you and the good Commodore a, yeah, Bill Porter is confirming the SCOW 
uh, guru that he is, that it's in Lake Mendota is where the e-scow gnats are. Hundredth anniversary. Stingray, thank you, Captain Jack. An amazing uh, contribution. Thanks, Julia and Tom. Yeah, Don Lunabos, we appreciate it. We appreciate all of you, as always, our Fozy. And if you would uh, help us, please, uh, every nickel helps. If you can give us a buck or two or five a month, become a patron, as we always ask. Patreon.com slash join slash Sailing Illustrated. You don't know how much that helps keep us on the air morally and otherwise. Clark Chapin, thank you, sir. Alex Kent, just on Lake Mendota at my in-laws. Yeah, it's a great lake. Terrific. See you Tuesday. Pedro Farling Sailor down under. Hey, Peter, send us another, uh, it'd be nice to have from Peter another uh, Pedro's personal perspective. We haven't had one from him in a while. Send us a video, Pedro. John Emmett, have a fantastic weekend. Everyone, see you from Villa Mora Sailing. We'll be back in Portugal next week. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to those who gave us audio, video, and images for today's show. Last thoughts, Julia. Uh, I don't I don't really have any today. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I do have one. That that the stuff that we forward uh, um doesn't go to international audiences unless you very specifically say so or unless you have friends who are are outside the United States that you forward things to and that helps us a lot. We well just yeah, yeah just sharing forwarding the show to your own page or a friend's page. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In inside or outside. We love, we love the Fozzie, and if we had nothing more than the Fozzie we have on here every show, oh, it'd be fun. <laughs> you know? it, it would still be fun and worth it, and we yes. appreciate it very much. We hope you all, as Emmett and others said, have a great weekend wherever in the world you are. It's 1,500 here in San Francisco, and the rain's about to start a little bit, not too bad. Hope you have an unrainy, a nice weather over your weekend. Hope to see you on Tuesday. In the meantime, sail fast, sail safe, and have fun. Ciao for now. <laughs>